Good evening, everybody. I hope we're all doing really, really well. Wanted to hop on the live stream this evening and talk a little bit more about training for a 5K. I know this is something that we began talking about this time last week. Um, I was talking last week about you know six way, uh, sorry, five ways in which you can improve your 5K time in the next six weeks. That video seems to go down really well, so I wanted today to start getting a little bit more detailed in terms of talking about specific types of session that you can use to improve your 5K time. Now this is, again, this is relevant whether you're a brand new runner or whether you're a runner who's been running for a long time and has perhaps hit a little bit of a plateau with your 5K time, or perhaps even you're a marathon runner who is coming back to shorter, faster distances and want to really boost that 5K time as a new focus, a new thing to train for. Again, we're gonna go through the five different, uh, five different types of workouts that I want to be able to highlight really to you to then go out and perhaps integrate into your training so you can go out and run that faster 5K time. Now, while we've got a few people coming onto the live stream now, I want to ask you all a question. And this is kind of related to what we're talking about here because a lot of the time we tend towards the types of sessions we enjoy and are good at rather than necessarily what we need to work on. And I'll delve into that a little bit deeper as we get into this. But the simple question is, are you a runner who specifically enjoys the shorter, faster stuff, or do you specifically enjoy the longer, easier, slower work? So which are you? Short and hard, long and slow? You tell me down in the comments. Okay, also, before we get in any further into this, there's a giveaway which I want to um, tell you guys all about, specifically on this video, gonna be drawing it on Friday, and it's for our glute kickstart program. How many of us have been told we need to work on our glutes over the time, over time from our physios or our sports docs, whoever? I've got a 12-week glute-specific training program which will help you kickstart those glutes, those butt muscles, and I'm gonna be giving away one copy of that to somebody in the comments who specifically likes this video, subscribes, and tells me the answer to that question, whether you're a long, slow distance runner or you like the short, hard stuff. So let me know down in the comments, and you might be the lucky runner who wins that glute kickstart program copy. Okay, listen, let's get straight into this. So the first, the first type of session I want to bring up Funnily enough, is what a lot of people instantly think about when they think about training for 5K and improving their speed, but it's not actually, I believe, the biggest bang for the buck or the area which has the biggest impact on your 5K training. But let's address it straight off the, off the, off the bat. Let's talk about interval training. Okay, interval training, a lot of people will use that as their go-to in terms of speed work in the week. And again, if you are a runner who knows you need to work on your speed, hit the like button, give me that little bit of feedback, and um, yeah, it'll be interesting to know really what your, back, your um, experience is with these types of sessions. So interval sessions, again, to make it really straightforward, it's where you're working hard for a specific period of time or specific distance, and then giving yourself specific recovery window and repeating that for a specific number of repetitions. Obviously, beginning with a warm up, ending with a cool down. And for 5K in particular, there are sessions, there are so many different sessions you could do, but some of the classic types of sessions are sessions like 10 times 400 meters, or sessions like you know, four to six times 800 meters. And of course, you could also, rather than just have one set distance that you're repeating again and again, you can do pyramid type sessions, ladder type sessions, all sorts. So there's lots, you could just jump in to Google and, uh, and research. So I won't go through one by one. But when it comes to how you can actually go and use those interval sessions, think of it as a way really to train your body. Uh, of course, if, if you're if you're looking to run faster for a 5K, you need to train your body to get used to running faster. Now, with, let's say, 400 meter reps, you could be working at a pace which is you know, around about 15 to 20 seconds per K faster than your target 5K pace. Now, you're going to be doing 400 meters, so let's say one lap of a standard athletics track, and then resting for a set period of time. And what I'd do, I'd start out if it was the first session of these you're doing, with the goal of running that 400 meters in a consistent time from first through to the last one you do. So you don't just start fast and then tail off as fatigue hits you, which is what so many people do, by the way. But you're going to, you're going to as you do that, 
have a specific, let's say 90 second rest period. That's a great starting point. Now with that 90 second rest period, I'd keep that active, don't just stand absolutely static. But to begin with, let's just make that a walking rest. So you're walking, either walking around in place to the same point where you're starting that 400 meter lap again, or you're walking along, let's say the straight, knowing that at the end of this 90 seconds, you want to be at the beginning of the bend to go again. You're running round again for that second lap to the same point. Now, over time, I would reduce those 90 second rests down specifically to 60 seconds. Now, I wouldn't do that in one jump and you know, the next session you go, all of a sudden you've taken away a third of your recovery time. What I do over time is just knock away 10 seconds recovery, 10 seconds recovery, 10 seconds recovery across the course of a number of weeks. That's getting you used to running that fast pace at obviously that set distance with less and less and less recovery, meaning that you'll be better at stringing together those five Ks in a row on race day at what is a slightly slower pace than the pace you're doing the 400 meters, but still the target race pace that you have set in the first place, as long as that's a realistic target. Now, of course, with that in terms of realistic target, take a look at Jack Daniels V dot. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just drop it into, uh, into Google, Jack Daniels, and then V D O T, uh, V dot calculator. That you can plug your existing um, or recent, let's say, best effort times over a known distance, and it'll give you an, an indication in terms of what kind of paces you should be hitting, what kind of times you should be hitting across those, let's say, in this case, 400 meter intervals. Of course, you can do 800s, and with that, four to six 800s, we'd be looking at starting that with three minutes recovery between reps, and then dropping that to two minutes 30 over time, and then dropping that to two minutes recovery between reps. So you're giving yourself an opportunity to actually get your body used to maintaining that increased level of effort, that increased level of work, whilst reducing its capacity to recover, the time it needs to recover. Your goal here is to recover as quickly as possible so you can go again and hit that same level of work consistently, rather than, as I said beforehand, starting strong and then fading. If you find yourself doing that, starting strong and then fading, it's an indication that you're starting too fast, you're pushing too hard to begin with, perhaps that's that goal time that you're setting for each of those reps is too fast, or, um, or the goal time is too short, you're having to run too fast to be able to sustain that. So adjust accordingly, and give yourself the time, and it does take time to start to see that improvement. Okay, now, of course, the benefit of these kind of interval sessions, a big part of it is getting you used to, and again, before we talk about, if, before we were to talk about the physiological side of things, I actually think the psychological side is really important. It gets you used to mentally putting you in that place where you've got to get used to pushing and you've got to get used to the, for want of a better word, pain that comes with pushing hard, that those of us who have tried to run a park run PB or a 5K PB will be very, very used to. Of course, there are, there are also physiological physiological benefits in terms of improving your running economy and, um, and just generally you know, improving your speed endurance, which come from doing these types of interval sessions. Now, the second type of session that I wanted to highlight is actually counterintuitively not a speed session. There's a good reason why here. I want to make sure that we don't forget about the importance of a long, easy run. Now, very different to marathon training, of course. If we're marathon training, those long runs, you know, for some of us, they'll look like 20 mile long runs. For a 5K runner, if 5K is your, 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 your distance, the distance that you're focusing on, you're not doing anything more, um, I would cap your long run at, at the longest 90 minutes. Okay, for some people, it's gonna be less, but 90 minutes is a good place to build up to in terms of building a, um, in terms of building a good underlying aerobic base, because it's that aerobic fitness. It's your underlying stamina and endurance that really determines how fast you can run 5K. It's not the speed sessions that we opened up with in terms of this live stream. And I know lots of people, like I said, they have those speed sessions, they, they go to, they are the things that people think are the kind of the secret source in terms of improving your 5K time. But the actual determining factor is your aerobic fitness, your aerobic power. Now, the only way to build that is to make sure that you're spending time exercising at an aerobic, uh, aerobic level of intensity. And by that, I mean essentially conversational 
easy, relaxed, long run pace. If you're heart rate training, we're talking kind of zone two type training. Rather than um, at the other end of the scale, and I spoke last week about polarizing your training, we don't want to see you spending too long at the other end of the scale. It should be this kind of 80-20 type ratio um, where you're doing 80% of your work at this long, easy, relaxed run pace. If you spend too long up here, chances are not all of that's going to be quality work and it'll feed into this kind of gray area, middle ground, kind of rough zone where you're not really getting the training benefit of the aerobic work, you're not getting the training benefit of the quality speed work, you're just making yourself tired. So we need to make sure we're getting our training paces right. Again, Jack Daniels VDOT is a great place to start with that. Drop in a, let's say, a half marathon time or a 10K time or even your best 5K time recently, and it'll tell you what that should equate to in terms of your easy pace run. A lot of people are very surprised how easy and how slow that actually is. But that's the kind of intensity, that's the kind of pace you need to be working at to really build that underlying aerobic engine. Now, it's also fantastic in terms of building strength and uh, strength and endurance in the legs. There's a certain type of strength, as much as I, I'm in the studio right now, and you know, I talk a lot about strength and conditioning work, rehab work, prehab work. There's a certain type of strength, I believe, that can only be built by time on the legs and mileage. And these are the sessions that give you exactly that. So a good way of thinking about it, or, or trying to appreciate the importance, is that although your 5K feels like a really fast, in the big scheme of things, um, really hard distance in terms of the effort you put in, in comparison to a marathon, the, the, it's not just the speed work that gets you those improvements in terms of this, the, the pace that you can sustain across 5k and therefore obviously your 5k finish time. Your aerobic endurance is anywhere between 60 to 80 percent of the, um, the determining factor, as I said earlier, in your ability to actually run faster for longer over that 5k distance. And of course, the longer you go, the more it becomes that, that determining factor. So yeah, it's just so important. You can't ignore those long runs. As much as it's tempting to have interval sessions here, hill reps there, tempo workouts here, we still need to make sure we're sitting that 80% of your run volume is easy work. Now, a good way to flip that around, good way to do that is where you've got all these different types of sessions, and I've only gone through two so far in this video, but where you've got all those different types of sessions, you can, instead of just trying to fit everything into one week, you could do week A, week B, week A, week B, or week A, B, B, C, A, B, C. And you can do, let's say your Tuesday session is your session where you're going out and, uh, and doing the quality work. Um, that's where on week A, it could be intervals. Week B, it could be a whole work. Week C, it could be, uh, it could be tempo work. Okay, now let's have a quick look at the comments here. Rachel's saying that she wants to improve her 5K time. However, she does prefer those longer, slower sessions, not done intervals for ages. And I saw that comment come through, Rachel, at the beginning of me talking about those longer, slower sessions. So hopefully me saying what I've said about that and saying that it's so, so important will at least give you some, um, some what's the word, uh, some hope, I suppose is the right word. I don't know, that's probably a bit dramatic, but do you know what I mean? Give you some comfort in that you've been doing the work that puts the underlying base in place, the foundation in place, and it's from there that those interval sessions that you've been skimping on, you can actually start improving the speed work. Lots of us, and I think our guys, us guys are probably worse at this, a lot of us, um, we just want to go and smash ourselves again and again and again and again, and we don't build that underlying base. And that will start to come back and, uh, and bite you when you start to try and push on for longer distances. That's for certain. Okay, um, RT says, progression runs, will they help? Uh, if yes, how many miles for a progression run? Again, if we're looking at um, thinking about kind of progressive tempo runs, we can build that up to, a, let's say, a six mile, progression, uh, six mile progression run. So you could do two miles at, so after a little bit of a warm up, two miles at a fairly easy pace, then building to three miles at a steady pace, one mile with basically everything you have left. That's a nice way of thinking about that. Um, and then a little bit of cool down and, and obviously finish as you would do normally. So that, that's a nice way of having that kind of progression run. And yeah, we're gonna talk about tempo sessions as we go on in this live stream. If you're finding this helpful, hit that like button, by the way. I always find it helpful to know that this is the kind of thing that you um, folks all would like to hear more of. And of course, as well, I asked that question up front. So I wanted to know whether you as a runner 
trend towards enjoying the shorter, harder stuff hard, uh, first, or whether you're more a fan or you find yourself better at the longer, slower, steadier stuff. You know, it's interesting how a lot of us kind of tend to drift towards what we're good at and perhaps neglect, therefore, what we need, need the most. So let me know down in the comments, what are you? Are you short and fast or long and slow? Okay, now, don't forget also about the giveaway, but we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, running with Mark says you're, uh, you're hoping to or aiming to go down from um, 17 minutes for 5K to 15.59 probably do it in the spring before your ultras. That would be a great effort, Mark. I look forward to hearing about your journey in doing exactly that. Okay, let's talk about the next one of these kind of key types of session to help you improve your 5K time. Hill reps. There are all sorts of different types of hill reps that you can do, or it's not even hill reps, hill workouts that you can do. And there was a study um, a little while back looking at 5K runners in particular, looking at the effect of doing different types of hill training 5K performance. And what I found really, really interesting off the back of that, where you had one group doing short, fast hill reps, one group doing longer, in the big scheme of things, slightly slower but more drawn out, hill efforts, both those types of hill training provided benefit. Um, I don't believe, if I remember rightly, and I haven't got it off the top of my head, but I don't believe there was a big difference between the two. Um, and the kind of the key take home for me for that piece of research was that it doesn't really matter for, for the majority, unless we're talking the high end kind of elite level, but for the majority of us everyday runners, it doesn't really matter what kind of hill sessions you do for 5K, it's just a case of making sure you're putting a, a, a regular hilly workout in your training because you will see the benefit. Whether it is short, fast hill sprints, whether it's long drawn out hill reps, and I'd lump Kenyan hills in with this as well. We're gonna talk about tempo workouts later on, but Kenyan hills, so, so, so powerful as a type of workout, but we'll get, we'll get into that. So let's think about two, you probably hear Charlie shaking over there. Um, probably hear, um, yeah, let's talk about the two different types of hill uh, workouts in particular to start with, those kind of short, short, hard hill sprints, and then of course the more drawn out efforts and, and the variables around those. So to begin with, if we talk about the hill sprints, quite often what I like getting people doing is a session along the lines of three sets of five times 30 seconds up what should be quite a moderate hill. Again, hard to really define unless we're gonna get into look, talking about gradients, um, which I don't really want to do, but just think kind of moderate hill, the kind of hill which um, you, know, you could run up at a steady effort for, for two or three minutes, but um, would, you know, you'd, you'd be pretty worn out by the top rather than this kind of long drawn out, few K easier, steady hill, which we'll talk about in a second. So three, rep, uh, three sets of five times 30 seconds. So the way I do that, you start after a warm up, start at the bottom, you're going to sprint up much quicker than your 5K race pace, but you're gonna sprint up, it's not an all out sprint, but not far off it, let's say 80% sprint. Sprint up for 30 seconds, turn it back, you're gonna walk back down for 30 seconds, okay? You won't get, um, sorry, you're gonna walk back down for a minute rather. You may not get all the way down to where you started, but then you're gonna turn it around again and you're gonna go again, regardless of whether you're back down to the bottom or not. You're gonna turn it around again and go again. Okay, again, 30 seconds. Turn it around, one minute recovery, turn it around, 30 seconds. We're doing five of those. Then at the end of the fifth, you're gonna walk it down, three minute recovery, and you're gonna do all that again. We're doing that the second set, and then after the second set, we walk it down for three minutes, and then we've got the third set. So it's, each of those three sets have three minutes recovery in between, but each of the reps within the sets have one minute recovery in between. Think of it as 80% sprint effort. Now, with that, of course, we really wanna focus on form, so holding yourself nice and tall, really driving with your arms, really picking your heels up, driving your knees forward, and keeping a quick turnover with your legs. A lot of people, when they start to get tired on hills, turnover starts to slow down, and they really start to get into a position where their posture starts to crumble forwards, and their knees will start to take a little bit more of the brunt. Now, if we then think about our longer, more drawn out hill reps, we're going to take a slightly different structure. And again, I'd go usually, nice, obviously, warm up to begin with, and then on a slightly less aggressive hill, so less of a gradient, you're going to be doing eight reps of two minutes at a steady 
effort up the hill to the point where at that two minute mark, you're at a point where you pretty much feel like you need to stop. Okay, so you're not just cruising like you would if you're addressing this hill in the middle of a long run. Okay, this is a, a steady effort up, but it's a point where the effort, although the, 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 the pace remains steady, the effort gets harder and harder and harder to maintain as you go. So at that point at the top, at the two minute mark, you turn it round and you easy jog all your way back down to the start. Doesn't matter how long it takes. Again, not timing the recoveries in this instance, but it's two minutes of hard work on the way up, then easy jog all the way back down to the start. Eight times through, cool down, recover, etc., etc. end of session. They're the two types of hill sessions that I wanted to highlight on this particular chat. Of course, there are so many different types you could do. Um, the kind of your imagination really is your limiting factor there. But the last one that I wanted to talk about, which is slightly different to reps, is Kenyan Hills. And again, there are all sorts of different resources. If you're not sure about Kenyan Hills, go and just stick them into Google and you'll, you'll learn more. But to talk about how I like to do it, there are a couple of different loops around here that I like to use. So around here in Norwich, there's a, a 4K loop that takes in quite a kind of nice Heathland area and, and has significant uphill as well as significant downhill and a couple of areas of a little bit of flat. There's actually not much flat on that one. Um, and a one mile loop closer to my house as well. Each of those, I know that within the loop itself, like I said, lots of up, lots of down, a little bit of flat. I obviously warm up to begin with, cool down to finish, but the main bulk of the session, I'm working at a level effort, a tempo effort. And we're going to talk about tempo work in a second and call it, I usually say, kind of sustainably uncomfortable. But a lot of the time we talk about tempo pace. Obviously, when you're working up steep inclines and working down significant declines, and then you've got flat sections, pace kind of goes out the window a little bit. But what we can talk about is effort. The effort should be pretty sustainable and should be something that feels a lot like your 10K race effort. Okay, best effort you can maintain for, for an hour, which for some of us, obviously 10K much shorter than that, for some of us 10K longer than that, but it's a good kind of ballpark that a lot of us will be familiar with that kind of effort. Sustain the effort, regardless of what the significant hill up or down is doing to you at that point because that will dictate the actual pace that that effort equates to but sustain the effort for that period of time and we can begin with a little warm-up to begin with and then just 20 minutes round and round around the loop be it a long loop short loop but around the loop that you found then cool down that's your session but you can also then turn that into 25 minutes 30 minutes 40 minutes 45 minutes as the main bulk of your session there Again, if you're training for 5K, I don't think really you need to push that beyond about half an hour to 40 minutes, but it's, again, entirely up to you. Of course, some of us are doing 5K as part of a training, uh, a training year for bigger events as well. So you can kind of play with that a little bit. Hill work helps you develop speed in a kind of a more of a surreptitious kind of a way. It's kind of speed work in disguise. It's not the same as going and hammering yourself on the track, but it helps you build stride length, it helps you build strength, and you'll find when you come back to doing more work on the flat, after doing a lot of speed work, the, uh, a lot of hill work rather, the speed will have improved for sure. Definitely powerful for 5K. Okay, if you're finding this helpful, do hit the like button. Um, I'd love to know the answer to that question, whether you are a runner who trends towards enjoying the, the short, hard type work or the long, slow type work. Which one are you? Um, we are all definitely different. Let's have a quick look in the comments here. So um, bah -bah, we've got Bart says, do you recommend hill races as preparation for 5K? For example, 5K uphill. Um, 5K uphill would be, yeah, that would definitely be hard going. I, I think race race experience depending on whether you're training for 5k or training for um for longer distance goes a heck of a long way so it's it's as much as anything else it's kind of managing yourself and managing your pace so yeah i would i definitely suggest booking some races in of different of varying distances um adrian says definitely more of a 5k runner struggling getting beyond 10 miles on runs with sore hips 5k pb is 1820 that's great going definitely um, okay, Jamie says, uh, Johnny rather says, I mentioned, uh, so hi James, you mentioned heart rate zone two for building aerobic base. You find it hard to run all the time, um, at all rather in zone two. You often have to walk and not, uh, to not end up in zone three. Um, will I build aerobic base in zone three as well? 
it's, I know this feels a little bit like a little bit of a cop-out answer, but it kind of depends on how your zones were set. Um, I've certainly found in uh, my experience over time that a lot of training zones that are kind of guesstimated, if you like, from different equations here and there, or from uh, devices that we quite often use these days in terms of Garmin and this, that, and the other, there's quite a lot of room for error. I think if you're serious about getting into heart rate training, I would invest in the events, the time, and it does some, most of the time come at a cost, but we can talk about that in a second, um, in going to actually get, get, some, um, get some work done with an exercise physiologist, get some testing done. A lot of the time, that is something that people will have to, um, obviously have to pay for, but if you go and look at your local university that offers sports science as a degree, and there are quite a few unis that offer that these days, or sports studies, or, or you know, there are a number of different um, degrees that will have people needing as part of their dissertation or part of their um, part of their, their work there they'll have them doing VO2 max tests and, uh, and OBLA tests so different types of physio physiological testing on endurance athletes that they need bodies for so go and check out various different um, yeah, various different unis and, and various different uh, faculties and just see whether there's anyone who's kind of trying to put the word out and say, hey, we need bodies. That would be a good way of getting that done. But yeah, if you can get some objective testing done to objectively say, right, for me, my heart rate zones are this, 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 and this, then that will allow you firstly to have the confidence in those zones. And then secondly, to answer your question a little bit more um, specifically, you'll find that for a lot of people, the experience is the same. A lot of people find what you've just described here, that actually you've got to slow your pace down so much to maintain your zone two heart rate that it gets so frustrating you end up having to walk. Persist. Walk when you have to walk, it's absolutely fine. It's, it's not a kind of a, I've, I've felt that when I started doing that kind of work. Um, I was just so frustrated, didn't feel like it was worthwhile, the, the work, you know, even being out there and running, I was running so slowly and, and having to walk at times to keep my heart rate down. But over time, you'll find that as your aerobic fitness improves, you will be able to keep your heart rate lower at a pace that you can sustain as a run. And then you'll find that that pace that you can sustain as a run improves over time, your heart rate still being managed. But it does take time. I don't know how long you've been at this in terms of trying to trying to um, trying to run in that zone two kind of range. But over time, it does improve. Okay, Rajesh says in a race, your max heart rate goes up to two hundred one, but according to your age formula, your max heart rate is one eighty. Um, for now, which one should you use? I would use uh, again. This this speaks to exactly what I've just been saying. That it's the um, the equations and the guesstimation type formulas that you can use can be so wildly out if you're using something like 220 minus h which is a, one of the classic kind of equations so i would go based on the data that you're getting if it's consistent off your heart rate monitor now if you're using a heart rate monitor with i don't know why i keep pointing to my wrist it's clearly not there but you know what i mean if you're using a heart rate monitor with an optical sensor don't take that as as gospel. I would be more reliant on a heart rate, heart rate monitor with a chest sensor. I do think they're more reliable, although the, the optical ones, I believe, are getting better. Hope that helps. Okay, so let's quickly talk about tempo workouts. So I mentioned this earlier, sustainably uncomfortable level of effort. What we're looking to do with a tempo workout is push your uh, lactate threshold further on. We're trying to get you into a position where you can run faster for longer whilst not dropping into that, dropping over that lactate threshold into that place where you're exercising um, anaerobically, which means that you're starting to build, or the, the kind of the outcome of that would be you're starting to build that lact a bit more lactic acid as a uh, byproduct, and you're starting to feel the heaviness in the legs that that lactic acid starts to produce. And it, it's, it's not sustainable in terms of you know, maintaining that pace for very much longer. You want to push the point at which that occurs further on in terms of the pace that you can maintain as a, uh, as a, as a steady run. So with our tempo workouts, there are very straightforward workouts we could do using the whole idea of running at a sustainably uncomfortable pace or a pace that you can maintain for about an hour. Things like warming up and then two miles at a tempo pace, then one mile at an easy running pace, then two miles at a tempo pace, and then a cool down, 
you know, that kind of session where you've got two blocks of two miles working hard, knowing that 5K is just over three miles. You've got two, two blocks of, uh, of two miles working hard, one block of a mile in the middle to recover in between those two efforts. You could go out and do a three or four mile long tempo run, having built that up from maybe just doing a, um, a, a two mile tempo run. You know, there's so many different ways in which you can do it, but working at that sustainably uncomfortable level is where you need to be to allow yourself to push your lactate threshold on a little bit further to the point where you're not tipping over that threshold um, at, a, at a pace where you previously would have, if that makes sense. So you're, you're able to run faster for longer is the kind of outcome of that. And by the way, those sessions, if you haven't done them before, they hurt. But again, they're, power, they're very, very powerful, very, very much worthwhile doing. Um, think of them as the sessions which make you kind of physiologically more efficient or more effective in what you're doing um, whereas your um, your aerobic sessions those long easy runs you know, they're building the capacity of the engine whereas these sessions they're kind of tuning the engine that's a nice way of kind of uh, of beginning to beginning to describe that and then further along in terms of if, if we're going to use this same analogy where we've got aerobic, aerobic work building the engine and the, the capacity of the engine the tempo work, tuning the engine, then specifically finding more gears in your gearbox is your neuromuscular strides type work. The sort of work which has you really working through the gears and starting to get your body used to turning the legs over faster. I mentioned this right up front. If you're going to run a faster, if you're gonna be able to run a faster 5K, you need to get your body used to running faster. Now. We do that in the form of things like our tempo work, yes, and in, in the forms of our interval work. But to get your body used to the turnover and the stride, maintaining the stride length as well as maintaining the turnover under fatigue, doing sets of strides, and I particularly like doing sets of strides in two different places in the training, one of which being at the end of a warm-up before you get into your main session, and the other being at the end of a long run where there's a little bit of fatigue in the legs, is a fantastic way of teaching your body to maintain good form and keep the quality in terms of mechanics there as you're going, as, as you're you know, running with those heavy legs, those tired legs. Now, what are strides? Think of them very simply as short little acceleration runs, which can be between, I usually say, between 60 to 100 meters long. And I quite often actually do them between lampposts. I picked at the end of a, a, a run before I kind of cool down and go home. I say, right, two lampposts. I'm going to, to run for the next, I'm going to accelerate for the next two lampposts. And then I'm going to walk between the third and the fourth, fourth lamppost, if that makes sense. And then I repeat that um, roughly kind of four to six times. Now, with that, we start out easy jog, but even with the easy jog, we're thinking about form. So we're nice and tall, nice and upright, hips up and forwards, picking our feet up, nice high cadence, using your arms, driving back, head up on top of shoulders rather than chin poking forwards. We then, as we keep going, we're picking our feet up more and more and more, we're driving our knees forwards further and further and further, and higher and higher and higher, we're driving our arms harder, turning our legs over quicker, and the pace increases and it's almost I like to think of it as kind of a caricature of good running form you're really trying to reinforce what good running form feels like so that your body remembers how to do that under fatigue okay now again you don't, you don't need to do that after every session but getting into a habit of just doing that before a cool down is a really nice way particularly after a longer session um, and a kind of a, a slower session of just running a little bit of, of, of zip back into the legs now, let's quickly have a look at the comments. Uh, Pierre says he, uh, there we go, Pierre says he loves the sustainably uncom uncomfortable um, as a tempo philosophy. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Um, can, strides, can strides rather be reprogrammed? Carl says, and, and Carl, I'm assuming by that you mean can your running form be reprogrammed? Can you ad adapt your running form? There's a lot on this channel that I've, posted previously about running form and yes I, I firmly believe it's a skill that can be relearned reprogrammed it takes a little bit of time and it's important to focus on the right things uh, for sure and I, I would start with posture posture and cadence kind of your two easy wins really um, but yes it absolutely can be Monica says hello from America good to see you Monica um, okay folks I would love to know if you found this 
helpful. If you find these live videos, hit the, uh, if you find them helpful, hit the like button. Um, don't forget as well to subscribe and don't forget about the giveaway that I announced at the top of this video. The giveaway where I'm giving away a copy of our Glute Kickstart program to uh, one of the runners who comments down in the comments on this video. I'll be selecting someone at random on Friday. You need to have commented, you need to have liked the video, and of course you need to subscribe to this channel. If you don't know about the Glute Kickstart program, check it out in the, uh, the comments. There's a link through to the Glute Kickstart program. Um, it's something that helps you deal with something that we are all told so often by our physios that we need to work on our glute strength, we need to work on using our glutes more as we're running, all that sort of thing. The program deals with that step by step, and it's only in a three-stage system through across 12 weeks. So anyway, keep an eye out for that. I will be contacting the winner on Friday. Okay, so, oh, Carl, you're in, you're in Zurich. I've been to Zurich once, absolutely love the place. Um, let's quickly sweep the comments one more time. Good, good. Really good to see you all here, folks. I'm gonna, want to, I'm gonna try and make this, this Monday session a regular thing, this session where we jump in here onto the live stream and just talk about different aspects of training. I certainly think it's, uh, it's an interesting, there are so many different interesting topics that we could cover and uh, I'd like to get your feedback. So if you find this helpful, hit the like button, subscribe, and I'll be back for more videos to help you improve your 5K time, your 10K time, your marathon, all sorts of different aspects of your training. And I'll see you very soon. Take care now. Bye-bye.